This Advent season, we are getting a close look at Luke's story of the birth of Jesus. So we are in Luke chapter 2, beginning with verse 8 this morning. In that region, there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Messiah the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in the manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. This is a story of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. On Friday morning of this week, a new story came across my screen that caught my eye. Compared to the week before Christmas 2019, There are 800 million more packages in transit (laughs) this week before Christmas 2020. 800 million. That's a lot more boxes and envelopes out there trying to find a home. Of course, there are multiple reasons for the overload. Many of us are having things like dog food and toilet paper delivered to our doorstep now. Most of us did our holiday shopping online. And there's a vaccine in transit. Hallelujah. Add to this a major snowstorm in the Northeast, and the end result is we wait. The advice was if you have something to be mailed this week before Christmas— Take a deep breath and cross your fingers. (laughs) So I did just that. I had a Christmas present to exchange. I bought a skirt for a child who won't wear skirts, but I didn't know it when I bought it. And when I overheard the news that skirts are bad, I knew it had to go back. An exchange was in order. But this was just the first decision in a long list of cross-my-finger choices. A carrier had to be selected, the speed of delivery determined, and then the drop-off location picked. So many options for delivery. When I look at the seven verses of Scripture for this morning from Luke's Gospel, I'm relieved. Because I see just two options for message delivery. Angels or shepherds. If pushed to make a choice, I wondered this week which I would prefer. Angels are speedy, uh, but they also seem unpredictable. Startling. Angels have this opening line that they use repeatedly in the Bible. It's even in our short passage in verse 10. I'll cue you, you know it. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. Yes. Why is it that angels continually say that? I was remembering this week a video prank that was done a few years ago by different people who would place a cucumber by an unsuspecting cat And when the cat spotted the cucumber, the cat would jump sky high. You see, angels seem to have a similar effect on people in the Bible. Can you imagine a group of angels? What Luke calls a heavenly host. Luke says a multitude of the heavenly hosts were praising God and saying glory to God. There is an alternate translation to heavenly host. Some Bibles say a heavenly army, an army of angels, God's army. New Testament professor Amy Jill Levine says, no wonder they can sing about peace. This is the peacekeeping force of the universe. Peace among whom those God favors. 
You know, I'm thinking angels don't look much like four-year-old children or 30-year-old female models. I think I'd rather avoid them if I can. In the Bible, a message from an angel demands a response. You have, a, you have to sign for this delivery, or you have to appear in court. When angels say go, we are to pull ourselves together and pack up our courage and set off. Like Abraham and Sarah, or Moses, Jonah, Mary, the shepherds. Angels seem to appear when things need to be shaken up. And they summon people to enlist. Angels are startling. You know, I think I might prefer shepherds. But the thing about shepherds is they're hard to spot because shepherds are the overlooked among us. In the first century, they were the people on the bottom rung of the social ladder. For those who couldn't find work anywhere else, The fields, tending sheep was a last resort. Shepherds, I think, had dirty jobs before having a dirty job was glamorized. They worked long, hard, dusty, cold hours away from most people. The stereotype of a shepherd in the first century wasn't strong, clean-cut, responsible with a lamb over their shoulders, loving and kind, The stereotype of a shepherd in the first century was that they were liars and thieves. Their testimony wasn't allowed in court. Many towns had ordinances banning them from the city limits. And some claim that a shepherd's job description kept them from observing the Sabbath, rendering them ritually unclean. And that would mean that they were then classed as sinners based solely on their job descriptions kind of like tax collectors. Whether that's true or not, it is definitely true that shepherds were an isolated, left-out group. I think they were shunned by most decent people. An important thing to notice in the Christmas story is that those, those who can't be trusted in respectable circles are trusted by God. Mary, a 14-year-old girl from a town no one has heard of, and now shepherds. These are the good news evangelists. And whether I would pick them or not, it is wise for me to be on the lookout for them because the divine force has selected them to lead, to show us what is really real. The contents of the package that the shepherds are entrusted with by the angels is good news. That's what the angels call it in verse 10, good news. The Greek word for good news was a common word in antiquity. It could mean a tax break or it could mean a parade. Both were good news. There is even an inscription from the 9th century BCE that celebrates the birth of Augustus Caesar as good news. But Amy Gillivine says that she thinks that shepherds are to be a contrast to Caesar because shepherds do the work of protecting what is vulnerable, protecting the vulnerable. Caesar Augustus does not do that. And the scripture tells us that the good news that the shepherds carry is different from the sort of the emperor The good news the shepherds bring is great joy for all people. Now, the emperor actually does deliver a gift to all people. Luke tells us in the opening line of chapter 2, in those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. The emperor's gift is displacement. The emperor's gift is a census. But the good gift the one that I'm looking for, the one that I'm hoping is present on my doorstep is the great joy for all people and it is found right where the shepherds lead us. 
It is the simple and yet complicated love. It is God made one of us with tremendous care. This week, I I listened to a conversation between author and pastor Marlena Graves and Nathan Foster, who is a leader of Renovare. Pastor Marlena's Advent challenge to Christians everywhere is to see the world from the bottom up. Look for the divine and humble people, she said, and the impoverished, and those who are usually overlooked. She told Nathan Foster that when she is mindful of this practice in her own day-to-day routine, she often feels compelled to curtsy or bow to everyday saints that she encounters during the day. Nathan Foster replied to her challenge with a quote from Howard's End. The difference between sociologists and poor folk is that poor folk know what they're talking about. I believe that's true. I believe it's true as far as the good news of Christ is concerned. Poor folk know what they're talking about. I'm told there was a shepherd teaching here last night in this very place where I stand with a microphone. A woman who spent 40 years in prison, 20 of those on death row, now helping those who are released from prison to find work and home outside. I know of a shepherd on staff at Haven for Hope, not too long ago honored by the governor of Texas for their work, who at one time was a client, homeless and helpless at Haven. I know of shepherds in Piedras Negras. I know of shepherds in Kenya and in Burundi, Africa. I've worked for shepherds. I've worked for shepherds in College Station, Texas, and even right here in this church. I see shepherds in this congregation. And when I'm honest, I have to admit that I do my best parenting as a shepherd, remembering what it was like to be 23 or 20 or 13. But if you're like me, you long to be an angel, and maybe you most closely resemble an angel, seeking to startle people with your glory, your big call to action in the right direction. But last I checked, God has no need for more angels. Those positions are all filled. But shepherds? Shepherds, that's a different story. There are always openings for those who will protect the vulnerable, for those who know that the lowliest are in fact the closest to the good news. Let's apply for those job openings today. Will you pray with me? Eternal God, We have become very good at waiting. Perhaps we are looking in the wrong places to find solutions to our problems. Would you set our gaze this day on the things that we overlook? Would you set our gaze on the people that we overlook? Open our ears to hear the stories of shepherds because we want to get our hands on good news right now. Amen.